The problem, the problem we're dealing with is how to get a key from one entity to the other, especially a secret key. Okay? Two users, we know we want to use shared symmetric key encryption to encrypt our data, but for that to work, the receiver of the data, of the encrypted data, needs the same key as the sender. And we can't send the key across a public network because if someone can intercept that and find the key. So we need to encrypt that key when we send it across the network, but we get this problem of, well, what key do we encrypt it with? And so far we've looked at using a, some symmetric key encryption to encrypt our symmetric key. So we have two types of keys. So to get a, what we call a session key from me to you, I send that session key, but I send it encrypted to you, and I encrypt it using a master key. So that assumes that I and you have shared a master key in the past. So if somehow we've shared a master key, then we can encrypt session keys. And the concept is that we use session keys to encrypt data for some time period, for a session, and then we can change that session key after some time and change it quite easily. When I say easily, I mean the computer can do it using some protocol automatically. The human user doesn't have to be involved. So every, every TCP connection or every five minutes the, across the network they exchange a new session key, safely encrypted using the master key. So the problem with that case then is, well, how do we get the master key? We either manually exchange well, we must manually exchange the master key. If we manually exchange master keys with everyone, then there's a lot of exchanges needed. So the approach that we arrived at was using a, a centralised key distribution centre. That each user manually exchanges a master key with a KDC, and then for the two users to communicate, they go via the KDC to get a session key. So this reduces the number of manual exchanges. And we went through some operations, uh, all those f five steps, and how an attacker could, if they try to attack, how this, this, how this protocol stops the attack. So it's all about getting a shared secret key between A and B. The other approach is to use asymmetric cryptography to encrypt the shared secret key. What's asymmetric crypt cryptography? What's the other name? Asymmetric is public key crypto. Okay, so asymmetric in that the, the keys are different. We have a public and a private key. We don't have symmetry between the two users' keys. So the idea here is that I still want to get a secret from A to B. But instead of encrypting that using symmetric key crypto, we'll encrypt that using public key crypto and we'll see some advantages of that. Some practical things comparing symmetric versus asymmetric cryptography or symmetric versus public key crypto is that public key algorithms are quite slow. RSA, Diffie-Hellman uh, and other public key algorithms, when we encrypt a large amount of data, they are very, very slow compared to symmetric key algorithms. For example, RSA encrypting data compared to AES is maybe thousands, it could be thousands of times slower to use RSA than AES. So in practice, we don't want to encrypt large amounts of data using public key cryptography. We'd like to use symmetric key ciphers. So a common application, therefore, of asymmetric encryption is to just encrypt a small amount of data encrypt a secret key. For example, what we do is that I encrypt an AES key encrypted using RSA. I send that encrypted key to someone else, they decrypt it, and then encrypt the data using that AES key. Again, use public key cryptography to encrypt a shared secret key. And then encrypt your data using that shared secret key. And that's a very common way in which the two different types of cryptography are used. We'll go through 
Well, actually, we'll mainly go through the first two, some different protocols to, to achieve this and, and arrive at some problems with using public key cryptography. First, let's see if I can show you, and I think I've done it before, but I'll, I'll try and illustrate again the speed differences between AES and RSA. Let me bring up some instructions. What I'll do is just uh, use OpenSSL just to show you the speed differences between RSA, for example, and AES, two common algorithms. Uh, but I need to remember the exact commands. OpenSSL is uh, the software that provides a library of many different ciphers and it has an option to do a speed test. So this is doing some just some speed tests with AES, 128-bit key, and CBC is the uh, mode of operation. And it does for three seconds encrypts different, different size blocks. And It gives a lot of information. Maybe we'll just select one of them here. If the blocks are, say, 64 bytes, it could do, this is 91,000K or 91 megabytes per second. So AES could encrypt 91 megabytes per day of data per second. So that's some indicator of the speed of when we use AES. Now I'll do a similar speed test, but with RSA. So with RSA, we have uh, different length keys that we can have, that's so the private key. So it does some tests. In fact, in this case, with the 10 seconds, it uh, uses the private key uh, uh, for 10 seconds and, and records how many it can do as fast as possible. And at the end, it will report some summary statistics. It may take a little bit too long. The, um, with RSA, when you use the private key to encrypt versus using the public key to encrypt, the private key is much, much slower than using a public key. Remember, the public key is usually this value of E, which can be small, maybe 3, maybe 65,000, or about that. That is, it's, everyone may use the same. The value can be chosen to be very fast when we use it to implement, because remember with RSA, you take a, your message, you raise it to the power of E, mod by N. If E is small, that's good. But with using D, the private key, you take the message raised to the power of D. If D is very, very large, that takes a long time to calculate. So encrypting using the private key is much, much slower than encrypting using the public key with RSA. So it runs it with both. When we encrypt with a public key, sorry, we'll go the other way. When we encrypt with a private key, we use that for signing something. I want to sign a message, I encrypt with my private key. And you verify that using my public key. So that's the using RSA or public key crypto for authentication. I want to send you a message, I want you to be sure it came from me, I will use my private key, you will verify with my public key. So the, the output here is saying that if you use RSA with different key lengths, say 1,024 is common, it can sign, that is use the private key, uh, that's how long it takes for one 
signature operation, or it can do 4,500 signings per second. It can verify much faster. This is using the public key. Signing uses the private key. Verifying uses the public key. It's, what, 4,500 to sign, 68,000 to verify. So a factor of 10, more than 10 times faster using the public key than the private key. So the first point there with RSA, using your public key is faster than using the private key. So verifying is much faster than signing. It's hard to compare with AES, but here we've got uh, in the order of, what, 60, in the best case, 68,000 uh, encrypt operations per second. When we used the speed test on AES, it was, for example, there in three seconds, it did 425,000, no, 4.2 million operations in three seconds, which is about one million operations per second. With AES, it's encrypting about one million times per second. With RSA, it's about 68,000 times per second in the best case, 4,000 times per second in the worst case. Now, there are some differences, but rough comparisons, AES, a million times per second, RSA ranges from 4,000 to 60,000. Just trying to show the point that AES is much, much faster than RSA. So if you want to encrypt a large amount of data, we generally use symmetric key algorithms like AES. We only use public key algorithms to encrypt small amounts of data. For example, encrypting a, a short key. Any questions on those concepts? So our aim is still to get a shared secret key from A to B. But we will encrypt that shared secret key using public key crypto. And we'll look at uh, some simple approaches for doing that and, and look at some limitations. The first one, very, very simple. A wants to get a shared session key between, with itself and B. So they both need to know KS at the end. So what they do, A has its own public key pair. It sends a message to B saying, I am A, and here's my public key. And what B does is uses A's public key, chooses a session key, KS, and encrypts that session key with the public key of A, and sends that back in the response to message uh, in message 2. When A receives message 2, A can decrypt because A has its private key. It was encrypted with A's pro public key, only A can decrypt. So no one else can intercept message 2 and see the session key because no one else has the private key of A. So here's a way to get a shared session key between A and B using public key cryptography. Very simple, just two messages exchanged. We don't need any other entities involved. There's no third party in this case. So you come to someone else, you just say, here's my public key. That other person chooses a session key and sends back the session key encrypted. And it works under some conditions. And the conditions that it works is if the, as assuming the attacker not, cannot modify these messages, it may be able to read the messages, but assuming they cannot modify them, it works well. But if the attacker can act in between A and B and modify or, or insert new messages, then they can do what we've heard of before, a man in the middle attack. And then it doesn't work. First. Can the attacker modify messages? 
Under how could you do a, an attack that would modify messages, or under what conditions between two other users can you modify messages in practice? Let's say I have a cable going between my laptop and this PC, and I'm using this protocol. So there's a cable going between them. Can you, as an attacker, modify the messages sent between my two computers? What would you need to do to modify those messages? Easy? Anyone have an idea? You need to somehow get access, physical access to that cable, somehow tap the line. Okay. And not just get access to it, but have some device that will create messages. Okay. Uh, so often intercepting messages is relatively easy, but modifying messages on some communication links is, is harder than just intercepting. So tapping a line and just recording what's sent, you just get a, access to the signal, is possible. But what you need to do to modify the messages is to get the signal before it gets to the destination B, modify it and then send it on without B noticing. And in some communication links that's not easy to do from an attacker's perspective. It's hard to modify messages without B knowing that someone's tapped my line. Uh, so in some cases, some networks, we can assume that an attacker will not be able to modify messages. Let's say we own the, the, the submarine cable going between two countries under the ocean. Okay. Across that link, we may assume that someone can't go under the ocean, the bottom of the ocean, and, and insert a device that will modify the messages being sent across that link. So we could assume that they cannot modify messages. So in some cases, the attacker can't modify. But if they can, the man in the middle attack is possible. Try it. Do a man in the middle attack so that you, as the man in the middle, the attacker, finds the session key. You find the session key and A and B don't know you have it. If A and B know that you have it, then of course they won't use it. So the attack is not successful. A successful attack here would be to an imposter, some other user, in between A and B, can learn KS, and A and B don't know that. So see if you can draw the diagram that involves a man in the middle attack in this case. And in fact, we've done it similar with Diffie-Hellman in the past, but I think you can do it more generally here for any public key algorithm. So the normal behaviour is A sends its public key and its identity to B. For example, where it's RSA public key and the identity, again, depends upon the system that this is used in. So we assume all entities have some unique identifier, whether it's a name, some computer-based address, but something that uniquely identifies that entity. And B, when it receives the public key of A, sends back the, or generates a ses session key. Session keys are typically just random values. For symmetric key cryptography, we just use a random key. It generates that random key, but instead of sending it in the clear, which we're not, we should never do, we encrypt it using the public key of A, and A decrypts that. So in the attack, if we have a man in the middle attack, A sends the, the normal first message, but they, it sends it to B, but the imposter somehow intercepts it and gets it before it gets to B. I write as lowercase a. It sends its public key, sends it to B, but the imposter intercepts, and then the imposter modifies something, forwards it on to B. What does it do? Change the public key 
to what? And the ID? It doesn't change the ID. For example, uh, if the ID is the, the user's name, then user, I send my public key and my ID is my name, Stephen Gordon. The imposter receives that message, modifies the public key, but the identity, Stephen Gordon, is sent on as is to B. So B thinks this is my public key. What does a public key look like? If you remember back, you've used OpenSSL to generate public keys. It's just a sequence of what looks like random uh, characters, random bits, encoded in different ways. By just looking at it, there's no way for B to know that this is I's public key or A's public key. So, and that's the problem in this system, is that B receives this. Ah, here's a message, it's from A. Here's A's public key. B doesn't know it's I's public key. It's just a public key that it's received. So, according to the protocol, B responds. Actually, B generates a session key. KS is generated, and then B responds encrypting that with the public key of what it thinks is of user A, but in fact is that of the imposter. It encrypts it thinking only the original A can decrypt, but in fact it goes back to the imposter intercepts, they can decrypt because they know, we should have listed what they know, they know A of course has PUA and PRA, I user, the imposter has PUI and PRI. They have their own key pair that was generated, so the imposter can decrypt this. When they decrypt, they learn KS. What do they do next? The last message. Remember, B, user A is still expecting to receive a response. If it doesn't, then it will not use the session key. So the imposter is trying to make A and B think that they've got a shared session key, but no one else knows it, but the imposter does actually know it. They encrypt that same session key with what? The original PUA. A receives this, A decrypts, it successfully decrypts, they use PRA because they expect it to be encrypted with PUA. They learn KS. A has sent the message and received the response as expected. B has received the original request and sent a response as expected. They think they have KS. They do, but the imposter also has KS. Now, how, how is KS used? It's used to send encrypted data between A and B. So anything sent in either direction between A and B, so that KS is used now to encrypt, let's say, using AES, a different algorithm. Any data sent between A and B using that session key can be intercepted by the imposter and decrypted because they also know the session key and that's where the, the system fails. We've seen a man in the middle attack on Diffie-Hellman. 
So on a specific case of public key cryptography. So this is on general of distributing public values. The flaw or the problem arise because when B received the public key, it has no way to know for sure if the public key inside that message is of actually of the user A or if it's of someone pretending to be A. And we'll see we need some way to make sure that we know that the public key is the correct public key. And we'll see that uh, towards the end today. So this scheme doesn't work in the case that we've got someone who can intercept and modify messages. Any questions on man-in-the-middle attack on our public key distribution? Who uses public key cryptography? Anyone here has used it? Everyone? What for? Some applications you've used it for or you may come across it? Again? Chat applications. Chat applications, what, how do they use public key cryptography? Maybe the one thing, yes, many applications may use it. Uh, one thing that it's very common and widely used, and we'll, we'll see it come up, is in web browsing, HTTPS. Okay? You use HTTPS for secure connections between you and the browser, and one part of that creating the secure connection and making sure that you are talking to the correct web server involves your browser getting the public key of the server and the concept is to use digital certificates to do that so the web server has a certificate containing its public key and the problem with that or the, the problem that certificates solve is to make sure that when you receive someone's public key, it is in fact their public key, not someone else's. It's the same problem that arised here. When B receives a public key in a message, it must be sure it is A's public key, it's not someone else's. And that will come up a lot in, uh, we'll see some more examples with HTTPS. So we need a way for B to verify this public key. Let's look at a different scheme. Here is again a way to distribute, the, the goal is to get the session key KS between A and B. They both know KS. But we're using public key cryptography to encrypt that. Here we of course have it encrypted and also authenticated. What happens? Initiator A sends a message to B, not containing a key, but in ca containing some nonce value and its identity encrypted with B's public key. This scheme, again, this assumes that A has the correct public key. That it, when we say PUB here, it is the public key of B. So we send some nonce value, let's say some random number, N1, and the identity of A to B. The meaning of this message is really to say, uh, well, the purpose is to check whether who we're sending to is in fact B. Because if I encrypt with the public key of B, who can reply? Or who can see the contents? If I encrypt with the public key of B, the, the only person who can see the, the contents of that message is B, because only B has the private key. So what I do is I send this random value, N1, and my identity to B. The B decrypts it. They know the private key. And they send back that random value, N1, in a response, encrypted with the public key of A, the idea of sending back N1 is for B to prove to A that I am B. Because the only person who knows N1 
is the person who has the correct private key to decrypt the first message. So what happens when B receives this? It learns N1 and sends N1 back in the response with the idea to prove to A that I am B. But in addition, B wants to check that the other endpoint is A. So what it does is it chooses another random number, N2, and encrypts it with the public key of A. If it's encrypted with a public key of A, only user A can decrypt. So the response from A, when it receives message 2, it decrypts. It sees N1 is included. This confirms to A that B must have sent it. If it contains N1, the only other person who knows N1 is the person who can decrypt the first message. Who can decrypt the first message? B. So B learns N1 and sends N1 back in the response. So this is some method for proving that you are the, the endpoint that, the, uh, that A expects it's communicating with. Authentication. And same with the third message. B chose some random N2, encrypted it using the public key of A. The only person who can decrypt it is A. Therefore, the only person who can learn N2 is A. And for this entity to prove that it is A, it sends that value of N2 back to B. If this entity was not A, if it was someone intercepting the second message, it would not be able to learn N2 and it would not be able to send back message 3. So these three messages are for both sides to confirm the identity of each other. To make sure who they're communicating with is the right person. The last message is containing the, the actual session key. So A generates a session key, it signs the se session key. So it encrypts with its private key. And then encrypts with B's public key. So here's two operations of public key cryptography where we use the private key to sign to confirm it came from A and the public key for confidentiality so that no one else can decrypt. Let's look at a couple of uh, attacks on that and see how this mechanism works. There's our original scheme. Let's see what a, 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 an imposter or someone in the middle can try and do and see why it won't work. So we'll draw it again and assume that there's someone intercepting. Let's say A sends the first message. It's intercepted. What can the imposter do? Can they see the contents? No, it's encrypted with the PUB, so they cannot see the contents. So they cannot learn N1. Right, they can guess IDA. They know it came from A, so the identity is going to be that of A. But they cannot learn N1, which was some random number chosen by A. We cannot guess it, because if the random number is long enough, it would take too many guesses. So what can they try and do? If they cannot see the contents, well, maybe they could try and send a different message to B. Without learning the contents, try and send a similar message to B to try and fool B into think it's communicating with A. 
What could it try? It, it could say... Let's say ID A, right? We know we're pretending to be A, so I'll say, all right, my identi identity is A. I'll choose some nonce value and I'll denote it as N3. It would not be N1 because I don't know what N1 was. If I choose some random number, it will not be the same as this, so I'll denote it as N3. And we can encrypt with PUB, that's okay. So what we do is we we know the identity of A, we're trying to pre pretend to be them. We choose some random number, N3, and encrypt it with PUB. What happens next? What does B do in response? B, in the normal case, decrypts. Yes, it can decrypt. It has PRB. It learns N3 and IDA. So what's the response that it sends back? It thinks this was from A, so it will encrypt with public key of A. And it will include the nonce value it received, N3, the one it received in here to, to confirm, and it will choose its own nonce value. N2 in this case. So B has received a message. He thinks it's from A. Here's the nonce value, N3. So what I'll do, I receive from A. Let's encrypt with the public key of A and send it back. And then let's include my own nonce value, N2, just to check the other side. Can the imposter decrypt? Hands up for yes. Good, everyone's correct. It's encrypted with a public key of A, therefore the imposter cannot decrypt. They cannot see N2. They know it's N3 in there. Okay, They created N3, but they will not know N2. In the same way as they, in the first message, the imposter had no way to learn N1. But they want to make A receive the expected message. A send the first message, they expect to receive the second one back. So what can the imposter do? They need to send a message to A so that A believes everything's working okay. They, A expects to receive something encrypted with a public key. So yes, the imposter knows the public key of A. What do they encrypt? Any suggestions? Let's look at what A is expecting. A is expecting the original nonce value it sent, N1, combined with a new nonce value, N2. I doesn't know the new nonce value, but can it, make, it can make one up. So it doesn't know N2. But nor does A, so it can make one up, N4. But the problem with the imposter here is that what does it include here? It should include N1. A is expecting N1 to come back. It sent N1 in the original message, it must come back. But I doesn't know N1, because it couldn't decrypt the first message. So whatever comes back here, I'll say N5, well... Maybe it's N3, but it won't be N1. And as a result, A will detect uh, the message I got in response. It successfully decrypts, but it doesn't contain N1. Something's gone wrong. So this is one example of why we use these nonce values encrypted because uh, if someone tries to modify things and pretend to be one of the other entities, we can check that and verify that uh, 
someone's performing an attack. Questions? Any other suggestions? I knows the public key of B, but it, it cannot decrypt something that was encrypted with the public key of B. So the, the first message was encrypted with the public key of B. The only person who can decrypt has the private key of B. So, yes, that's... I knows PUB, so in fact they can send a message here, they can encrypt with PUB, but they cannot decrypt this because they don't have PRB. If I cannot decrypt this first message, they will not learn N1, and the protocol requires N1 to come back. If A doesn't receive N1 back, it knows something's gone wrong. And the only person who can learn N1 is the person who has PRB, which is B. And it's similar with the other, that third message is doing the same thing for, from the opposite endpoint. That is, N2 is sent encrypted with P, PUA. The only person who can learn that is A. So the only person who can reply with N2 is A. So if B receives a reply with N2, it knows that it got that reply from A, not from someone pretending to be A. Because if someone was pretending to be A, they wouldn't be able to learn N2. So these three messages perform some verification of the endpoints. Once we know who we're talking to, B knows it's communicating with A, A knows it's communicating with B, the last thing is to exchange the session key. A generates KS, it encrypts with A's private key and then encrypts with B's public key. Why does it do that? Yeah, B wants to be sure that this came from A. An attack, a potential attack on that. Even if the first three messages were correct, So let's consider a different scheme. If it was A, the first three messages are the same. Let's to verify the endpoints. And the last message was not signed. What if it was a different protocol where the last message was just KS chosen by A encrypted with PUB? How would an attacker take advantage of that scheme? So let's say we used a different protocol. What can an attacker do? First three messages are exchanged. The attacker couldn't do anything there because of the nonce values. Then the fourth message is sent from A to B, containing the actual session key. Can the imposter see the session key? B. They cannot decrypt, but they could send a different message. Some other key. KX, that is. They, they cannot see KS, the actual session key there, but what they could do is send on a message to B and, and, 
uh, when B receives it, B thinks it has the session key. And that may be useful if it can now B thinks that the session key is X, KX. So we should sign that message. And that's what the, the last, the fourth message actually does. It doesn't just encrypt it with the public key of B, it signs it with the private key of A. So that the attacker cannot do such an attack of just modifying that message. This fourth message, B checks it came from A using PUA to decrypt this part. And it confirms it's confidential by using PRB to encrypt uh, the outer part. So a more complex way to exchange a session key using public key cryptography. Still, it's, uh, there's no third party involved. Okay, there's, there's no, it's only between the entities that are communicating. Uh, you can extend it after our lecture slides. There are ways to extend it to incorporate a third party, like the KDC, the Key Distribution Center, to so have a combination of public key distribution and KDC with master keys. But we want to come back to one problem, which is present here, but especially in the man in the middle attack, this problem of if you get a public key, how do you sure that it is that person's public key? Okay, if I, I post my public key on my website and I say download it and encrypt messages and send them to me using my public key, how do you know it's my public key? It's not someone who's maybe compromised my website and put their public key there saying it's mine. How do we be sure? Any suggestions? Someone gives you a public key, how can you be sure it's theirs? What, what can you do? Can you be sure? Not if it's just those two involved, then uh, we need some, normally we need some other entity to, to confirm or to verify it's theirs. So instead of just accepting the public key, have that public key, some other entity confirms, yes, that is Steve's public key. If you trust that other entity, then that scheme would work. So the approach is, if I give you a public key, you don't just accept it, you check and you confirm if someone else believes it's my public key. And if you trust that someone else, then it implies that you can trust that it's my public key. So we get actually another entity to sign my public key, saying, yes, this is Steve's public key. I confirm it. And we build up this, what we call a, a chain of trust that we can build up and say, OK, if I trust this person and they confirm it's Steve's public key, then I trust that it's Steve's public key. And we'll see that that's uh, commonly used when we use public keys in internet-based systems, uh, and, uh, and in particular in web, secure web browsing and digital certificates. So the issues of distributing public keys. How do you know that the public key that you've just got is of the correct person? How do we distribute public keys? Now we say, we've always said public keys are public, but making sure it belongs to the correct person is a challenging problem. And there are four approaches, or we'll list four approaches, arriving at the a commonly used one, public key certificates. Public announcement is easy. You post your public key in some public forum. On a website, in a newspaper, you print it and stick it on your door. 
uh, you attach it in the bottom of your email. So that's what we mean by public announcement. A public available direct directory is similar, but it's done using a computer. So when we say a directory here, some server keeps track of the public keys. So I somehow publish to the server and distribute through there. And the last two, the public key authority and certificates, use some automatic way and some central party to exchange public keys. So public announcements. So you just tell everyone, here's my public key. Now the problem is, it's hard to, uh, to prevent someone pretending to be someone else. Okay? We could do it in this class. Okay, and one way it's done in, in some, uh, some systems is that, okay, we're here, we have, all have our public keys, all right? And I read out, this is Steve's public key, and you record and take down, or with a computer, you, you get, I copy the file to you. So I can announce it to everyone, and then you know it's, it is my public key because it's me saying it. I wouldn't say uh, this is uh, someone else's public key, so you associate that with me. You know it's me, you trust me. Okay? And I could do the same, you could announce your public keys to me. So in a local forum, we could do that if we have some other way to verify who is doing that announcing. That is, we have some other form of trust. But in a, in a large system, that's not possible. If you see a public key attached at the bottom of an email or on a website, someone may have compromised that website or modified that email as it was sent across the internet to modify the public key. A publicly available directory is a similar concept, but usually we think it's done in a, a, in a computer-based system where each user publishes their public key to a server, a directory. So maybe there's some protocol or some website that stores public keys and you go there and you enter your public key and it's saved in that website and when any, anyone wants your public key they do go to the directory and download it. So A puts its public key in the directory, B puts its in the directory. When B wants to know A's public key it goes to the directory and downloads A's public key. So there are ways to do that. Of course we still have this problem. When A uploads its public key how does B know it was A that uploaded that, it's not someone else, an imposter that uploads it. So we haven't solved that problem. To solve that problem, we'll introduce another entity, what we'll call a trusted third party. Someone that we trust that we uh, use them to verify that it is the correct public key. Here's one approach for doing that, using what's called a public key authority. Before this exchange of what seven messages takes place, there are some assumptions about what's known. And we'll draw that. what is known before any messages take place or listed on the on the different nodes everyone has their own key pair so we can write that uh, A has PUA PRA B has its key pair and the authority has its own key pair, PU authority. In addition, we assume that the two entities involved here, A and B, the two users, also know the public key of the authority.
and that's when we say that they know the public key, then somehow they know they've learnt the public key and they are sure that it is the public key of the authority. Remember, that's the problem that we have. When we get a public key, how do we be sure that it is? Well, one way would be to have some manual exchange. In the past, A has gone to the authority and confirmed face to face that they are the correct people and got the public key of the authority. Very inconvenient, but if we only need to do it with one entity, it's possible. Similar, in the past, B has gone to the authority and confirmed face to face and got the uh, public key of the authority. So we assume that they know the authority's public key and they know for sure it's the correct one. It's not someone pretending to be the authority. What else? At the same time, when we learnt the authority's public key, the authority learnt the public key of A and B. So that happens before this exchange. An example, I'm the authority. All the students are the users in the system. And the, the task is, you need to come to my office, show me your ID, I will show you my ID, confirm we are the people who we were saying we are, and we'll exchange public keys. I, as the authority, will give you my public key, so you know my public key, and you will give me your public key. So that would be some manual exchange where we confirm via outside mechanisms that we trust it's the correct entity. So let's assume we've done that. Then the, the challenge then is to get the public key of A to B and similar from B to A and for them to be sure they've got the right public key, that it's not someone in the middle pretending to be A or B. That's what this protocol is for distributing public keys. Let's look at the, the messages. The first one, step one. A sends a message to the authority. A wants to initiate communications with, with B. So it sends a request, and it's, it's not specified here, but the request would say who they want to communicate with. It would include, for example, I am A, and I want to communicate with B. So the requests may include the identities of, of those users. Of a particular format saying, I am A and I want to talk to B. And T is a timestamp. So T1 is at this time. And we'll use timestamps in a similar way to nonce values, so to indicate whether we have replays. Because if there's a later such message with the same timestamp, then the authority will be able to detect it's a replay of the original one. So a timestamp can be used, uh, you check the timestamp in the message to the receive time, and if they are too far away, you treat this as a delayed or replay packet and ignore it. So, the authority sends back B's public key, the actual request, so the same request information and the same timestamp, but signs it with their own private key. So here we encrypt with the private key of the authority, which is called a, a signature, we sign. When A receives this, it verifies that it is the correct public key because it uses the public key of the authority to verify. A trusts the authority because it knows the public key of the authority. So anything signed by the authority, it also trusts. 
So the public key of B of importance inside here is what A learns when it receives message 2. And it knows it is the public key of B because the only person who could have signed it is the authority and we trust the authority. No one else can sign this message that we already trust. So when we say trust from now on with public key crypto, think about we know the public key of the person who's signing. So upon reception of message 2, A learns PUB. And it knows for sure it is PUB because it came from the authority and it knows for sure it came from the authority because it was signed with the authority's private key. And it verifies that using the public key of the authority. Up until now, B has done nothing. B doesn't know A wants to talk to it. The third message is that we send my identity, I am A, here's a nonce value, and these nonce values are used in the same as the previous scheme to confirm we're talking to the right endpoint, encrypted with PUB. When B receives message 3, it requests the public key of A from the authority. So message 4 and message 1 are uh, the same meaning. Request a public key of the person you want to communicate with. B sends the request to the authority. The authority sends back the public key of A. Signed by the authority, therefore B verifies and receives the public key of A. And hence it can send message 6. N1 that received in the first message, a new nonce, N2, encrypted with the public key of A. And A can confirm sending N2 back encrypted with the public key of B to confirm between A and B they're talking to the right endpoints. Note that these three messages, 3, 6 and 7, are the same as what we saw in message 2, 3 and 4 here. Uh, sorry, 1, 2 and 3. Okay, the same purpose here. We want to be sure we're talking to the right endpoint. In this scheme, we assumed at the start that A had B's public key and B had A's public key. Now we're introducing a, a scheme where we learn B's public key by getting it from the authority. Assuming we trust the authority, we trust that we've got the correct public key of B, and similar for B learns A's public key. Once they have each other's public key, then they can exchange if they want a session key. As we saw the fourth message in the previous scheme, we could uh, send the encrypted session key back. So this was... A, uh, a way to get each other's public key. Then how we use it is up to uh, the two entities. An important point is that it all relies on trusting the public key authority. If we don't trust it, then this scheme will not work. Or if we get the public key of someone else and we think it's the authority, then an attack can take place. But if we have the correct public key of the authority, then this scheme works. What if an attacker replays message one? What happens? Say these messages were sent today and then tomorrow someone who intercepted all the messages sends message one again to the authority. What will the authority do? Sends the exact same message. Timestamp, 
with the problem there. That is, it will recognise. So the timestamp here is to recognise, ah, this is a, a replay message uh, or a delayed message. So that's one role of the timestamp there, to, to recognise repeats. Uh, can someone send the wrong or a fake public key for B in response? That is, A sends the request to the authority, the authority sends message 2 back, but an imposter intercepts that. What can they do? Can the imposter intercept and modify message 2? If the imposter tried to modify message two in the response, they receive message two and send a modified message to A, what can they do? Can they decrypt message two? Yes, they can decrypt message two. They have the public key of the authority, so they, they know PUB. They know the request in T1, so they can modify. If they then want to send a message encrypted with maybe PUI, what do they encrypt with? PR of someone, not the authority. So A will learn that this has been modified because when they receive this message here, they decrypt with PU of the authority. If it wasn't encrypted with the private key of the authority, it will not successfully decrypt, and A will know that. So the imposter here cannot modify this content without it being detected by A. And that's the role of a signature. No one else can sign it except the authority. And it's similar in, in 4 and 5, and 3, 6 and 7 are that confirmation that A is talking to the right endpoint, the same as we saw in the previous protocol. So here's a way to distribute public keys. What's the problem with it? To finish today. Security, OK. What's the problem? Speed, in what way? Let's say we have 1,000 users. So every time one pair of users wants to communicate, they go through these steps. Send a request to the authority. Authority responds. Message three. The other endpoint sends a request to the authority, authority responds, and then they finish. Then another pair of users do it, and so on. Then there can be a performance problem. We rely on that authority. That is, let's say it has to happen thousands of times per second. Then the authority, this server, must handle these requests very, very quickly. If the authority fails or is down for a short time, then they cannot proceed. They cannot communicate. So a performance problem is that Every time two users want to communicate, they need to go via the authority. So next week will lead to a, one that overcomes that performance problem, very similar, but uh, doesn't require all com communication to the authority, and that is digital certificates. And we'll see examples of certificates in, in secure web browsing, HTTPS.